sometimes when we do these events, we spend a lot of time introducing the guest. I think uh, most people who are here are probably very familiar uh, with Jules Pfeiffer's work. Uh, suffice it to say that, in my view, Jules Pfeiffer is someone who has reinvented the comics form to serve his expressive needs not once but many times and is a hugely significant figure in the world of comics. Um, he's also a hugely significant figure in that world, I think, is a first-class comics critic. I'm going to, um, in a couple of minutes, show some images from the great comic book Heroes, which was a hugely important book for me and I think has been for many people and is still stands as some of the best writing about comics ever committed to paper in English. Um, on top of that, of course, Mr. Pfeiffer's career uh, includes uh, uh, writing for the stage, uh, writing for screenplays for films, including Carnal Knowledge and, and Robert Altman's Popeye, uh, children's books, uh, and work in many other media. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Jules Pfeiffer here. Thank you. Um, Jules, uh, we're going to talk later about your most recent book, Kill My Mother, as well as your new children's book, uh, Rupert Can Dance. But I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the comics you read as a kid when you were a reader that got you excited about comics. And I have a few images. I looked in some uh, interviews and, and just kind of pulled images from some of the comic strips that you've mentioned before. Um, and I'd just be curious to know what it was that appealed to you about some of these comic strips, uh, one that um, has recently been, oops, has recently been reprinted uh, to some extent is Wash Tubs and Cap and Easy, or as it started out, Washington Tubs 2 by Roy Crane. Uh, this is one you've mentioned a couple times in interviews, and it seems like it influenced a lot of people. What did you, what attracted you to this comic strip when you were reading it? Well, uh, um, take a look at panel two in the, uh, 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 in the lower tier, with his character Captain Easy. Is, uh, is spanking this young woman, which uh, uh, all of which was acceptable in those years in comics, uh, or in in in, the, in movies in the social you know media. Um, but uh, what I'm talking about is the art, the <coughs> incredible ease uh, <coughs> and fluidity that that drawing has. I mean, it's it's every line is in the perfect place. Uh, it's totally expressive. Uh, if you see Easy, who's doing the spanking, uh, his, his shoulders are hunched and, and the hand is up in the air and everything is as it should be. If you look at the young woman who is, you know, her back is to us, but the way her head is tilted, you can see, out, besides the cursing, her head is, she's full of rage. Her legs in the up, are up in the air and, and looking very attractive, but also in protest. It's a, a totally eloquent drawing, and that's what made Roy Crane such a hero uh, <clears throat> and role model to a gener several generations of cartoonists of the time, including Milton Kniff, who created Terry and the Pirates, which is the greatest of all adventure strips. But Milton began as a student of and, and, and Im imitator of Roy Crane. Uh, he was a... a a great strip artist, and and um, in addition, he I don't know if you have any more of his, but he did some beautiful watercolor backgrounds in black and white mm -hmm. for his daily wash tubs. He, he worked in something called craft tint, which could create half tones in newsprint, which is very rare. And he could do seascapes and landscapes, and they looked they, and. Outside of, in the foreground were these cartoony looking characters, cavorting, running, jumping, beating each other up. And in the background were these glorious, realistic settings of uh, oceans and um, forests. And you know, he, he did a lot of, uh, uh, you know, he was, Easy was a soldier of fortune, so he was not around cities very much. He was around a lot of jungles and on the high seas. And Roy Crane created the reality of these things while having cartoon characters in front. He was a great, great cartoonist. And this is work you would have been encountering, I guess, as a kid reading it in the daily newspaper, right? Yeah, there was a newspaper called the World Telegram, and um, uh, Wash Tubs and Captain Easy appeared in that on a huge comics page, and that was one of the highlights. I never missed it. Mm -hmm. Another one you've mentioned in interviews that's less well-known because it hasn't been reprinted is Abby and Slats. 
um, that started in 1939. This is a later example from 1959. Yes, this, this was, uh, it was created by Al, I mean, Al Cap, who created Lil Abner and drew Lil Abner. Well, he drew it some of the time. He had assistance to a, a lot of the work. Um, but uh, Abby and Slats was created by Cap to be written by Cap, uh, but illustrated by a famous magazine illustrator of the time, Rayburn Van Buren, who was about to retire for magazine illustration. It was just too hard work. And Cap came to him and asked him to do this comic strip. And Van Buren tried it out and discovered he loved it. Uh, the later examples are not very good work of, you know, by this time he was tired of the work and, and wasn't doing his best work. But he drew like a dream. He had a, a pen uh, uh, um, line that was uh, absolutely marvelous. And he did facial expressions and character expressions uh, and knew how to tell a story. I mean, what I loved about comics from the time I was little and love about them to this moment and what I try to convey in my own work is the connection between words and pictures. I mean, from the start, I knew that the code to this form, to success in this form, was putting words together with pictures in as natural a format so that readers would not be aware of it, just to do it as a sleight of hand. And, and so while you were reading it or looking at it, uh, the pictures combined with the words and to, to form one unit. And, um, and, if, and each panel, when done correctly, is a piece of theater. Uh, or, for that matter, a, a film story, as, a, as you'd have in a storyboard. Uh, except storyboards don't have dialogue, and you've got dialogue in these cartoons. And Van Buren, using Al Cap's script, created this rather sentimental, uh, I don't know if you were aware of the films of Preston Sturgis, but it was very much like a combination of Preston Sturgis and early Frank Capra. Uh, Americana. Uh, the myth of Americana, as, as it came to us in the 1930s and 40s in movies, which sentimentalized, but, but uh, 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 at the same time uh, was quite moving and, uh, and quite touching. And nobody did that better than Van Buren using the words of Al Cap. And I loved him. Um, another one that uh, you've mentioned in interviews, which seems in some ways like a natural predecessor for your work, is Walt Kelly's Pogo. And I say that because both because it has a lot of um, great verbal content and also political content. Well, and more than that, uh, Kelly, uh, before Pogo, or rather when Pogo was a character in his comic books and animal comics, and Al and. Albert the Alligator was the hero in the comic books, and Pogo was one of the, was his best friend. He reversed that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he reversed that in the comic strip. But before Pogo was a daily strip, Kelly had been made edi uh, um, art director or art editor, whatever the term would be, for a newspaper, a failing newspaper that was also just beginning. It was beginning and failing at the same time, <laughs> called the New York Star, which was a liberal paper. And I think uh, it was a successor to PM, it right? It was a successor to PM, which was much further left. Mm -hmm. And I mean, PM was a really left-wing paper, uh, which engaged my sympathies completely, and the Star was less so, but I was still, they still ran the columns of I.F. Stone, who was a hero of mine. And, um, and a role model for my politics. And, uh, and they had a new, this new political cartoonist named Walt Kelly, who ran single panel cartoons that I thought were the best work I had seen in the field in many years with the, with the single exception of Herblock. And, he, and, and I liked him better than Herblock at that time because uh, Kelly seemed full of rage and full of rage at the same targets that I was enraged at. And Herb Locke, as men as he got, was more civilized, uh, you know, except when he dealt with Nixon or McCarthy. But Kelly was angry all of the time, and I, and it, I love the anger because the political cartoons I love most, when I became aware through collections of the cartoons prior to World War I and uh, during the early years of World War I, of the Masses magazine, a socialist magazine edited by Max Eastman, uh, which had uh, 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 
artwork, illustrations, and cartoons by a notable number of the what we came to know as the Ashcan School of Artists, Robert Henry and John Sloan. John Sloan was the art director of the masses, uh, and George Bellow. And they did, and, and most notably a man named Robert Minor. Uh, and they did really angry, furious work about capitalism and, uh, you know, and, and the, uh, what uh, Elizabeth Warren calls the rig rigging of capitalism. And no, no one did this more stridently and more brilliantly than these uh, socialist artists. And then as time went on and the masses died, so did the rage in social and political commentary. And it all became very civilized. It all became um, simply graphic points about one thing and another, some of it very, very good. That's Fitzpatrick and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, some others. But the anger was replaced by, um, by a, a, a more distant and analytic eye. And none of that interested me in terms of the work I wanted to do. And I, and I wasn't even involved with that work yet, but none of that interested me in terms of my own politics. I was interested in the anger. I was in, interested in, in, in something, seeing a work on paper that expressed for me, that represented the feelings I had. And nobody did that better than, uh, than Walt Kelly in, in his editorial cartoons. And then later in the Daily Newspaper, when he started appearing in first PM and then the New York Post, uh, I mean, not PM, first the first star, and then the New York, when the star collapsed, the New York Post picked him up, which was in a liberal paper. Um, and it, he, he was extraordinary, the stuff he got in there. When Al Cap. Uh, the creative Lil Abner, who was supposed to be a great liberal in his comic strip in those years, uh, went into hiding as soon as Joe, Joe McCarthy appeared. And then Cap moved steadily to the right, so he wouldn't have to uh, lose papers because of his anti-McCarthy stance. Uh, Kelly just was a wild man and created some extraordinary and brilliant stuff. So these guys, uh, you know, all of the work any of us do we don't arrive at it on a Monday suddenly, suddenly having dreamed it up you know, and, and making up our minds. One way or another, we all get permission. We are given permission by the grown-ups we admire, by other artists, by somebody who uh, we open up a paper and see something that just blows our minds. And you think, wait a minute, I didn't think of that before. I can do that, or I can try that, or, you know, and with me, in terms of the political cartoon with these guys, as well as uh, uh, in terms of the more sophisticated and, and nuanced form of art, um, William Steig in his non-New Yorker phase and, and Steinberg. You know, the, the, the work we now know Steig and Steinberg for was generally rejected by the New Yorker in the beginning, always rejected, until their books became bestsellers that the New Yorker then began to see value in it and printing it, but they were, they were scared of it. Uh, but those guys were, you know, did extraordinary work in changing the face of, I mean, you called me a reinvented. They, but this, the form was essentially reinvented by Steig and Steinberg in that early work in the, in the early 1940s. And um, uh, so all of these people were simply ex extraordinary, and they gave me permission to move in the directions that I have then I moved in. Uh, you had mentioned um, you had mentioned before um, that, that Terry and the Pirates was a strip that you particularly admired. You had asked me to bring uh, this page. Uh, I don't know how many of you know the work of Milton Kniff. He, in his time, he was the most famous strip artist in the country, uh, and for good reason. Uh, he was the best of the artists, and he was the best of the storytellers, and he, and he knew how to combine words and pictures in a fluid Cinema, cinematic way that few others could do. His only rival was Will Eisner on the spirit, and Eisner was not nearly as uh, sophisticated uh, in those years as, 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 as Kniff did. When Eisner, after the war in 46 or so, Eisner's art became much more sophisticated and, and, and interesting and, um, and competed successfully with Kniff, who by that time had was moving down, and Eisner was doing some of his best work. But uh, nobody told a story. Nobody created characters. 
nobody involved the reader in terms of pictures and words and dialogue and storytelling and silences. This is, and I just wanted to show you this par uh, an example. I think this single strip is for me the best example of pictorial, pictorial storytelling, comic strip storytelling I have ever seen. Um, one of the characters in the strip, her name was Raven Sherman, and you see the man in the second panel with the dark hair, his name is Dudanik. Uh, long, you know, for a long time, he and Raven were having a romance, and she's a tough-minded, very strong woman, and, um, and they had one of those movie rivalries where two tough people are, are duking it out, but they both, they both adore each other. And surprisingly, because they were both popular characters, and she was a very popular character, uh, she was beautiful, she had red hair, she was very strong-willed. Um, she gets thrown off the back of a truck by a villain named Captain Judas. And, um, and surprisingly, she doesn't recover, she dies. And she dies um, in the daily strip which preceded the Sunday page, you know, maybe a couple of days earlier. And here in the first panel, you see uh, that she's, they buried her, and they're standing over the grave. And then there's a medium shot. Uh, Terry, who the strip is named after, is in the background, Dude Hennig in the front, and they're talking about moving on and talking about absolutely nothing uh, because they have, they are consumed with the horror of this sudden tragedy. And then in the thir third panel, silent, the, it's a, it's, it, the first panel is silent, the third panel is silent, the fourth panel is silent, and yet the silence, you see them moving, and somehow, remarkably, Kniff creates the passage of time in that panel. That's, that's a panel you can't look at fast. You would just stare at them in, in, in panel three. Uh, Terry it is, who, who's walking slowly, and you know he's walking slowly. He could be walking fast, you can't tell from a still drawing, but you know that he's just walking slowly because the mood of the piece, there's a mood here. And, um, and then we see Another silent panel that uh, Terry is seated and Dude Hennig is catching up in the background and he's working a long distance and, 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 and that distance creates the solitude of despair. It's just full of despair and slowness, slowness. There's no way of reading this page fast. And then they're walking in silhouette uh, in, in, and, um, and another panel of silence with a bird's eye view, kind of a John's, John Ford bird's eye from way high up, um, one of those Monument Valley shots that Ford loved to shoot. And then they talk again in silhouettes, and then another silent panel, and then they're resting for the night, and then they fall asleep. And then the introduction, as Terry is asleep, of a pair of strange feet in the beginning of the next episode, the next adventure. The concise, short, 11-panel uh, exercise in storytelling where we go from funereal sadness, uh, at the passage of time, uh, talking, waiting, and reality, toward the next panel, which is, after all, we're a daily newspaper, we have to have more adventure, so the beginning of the next adventure, to bring the reader around to wanting to know well, whose feet are those, and what happens tomorrow, and, and Kniff Olsen talked about this publicly and privately, it's all about buying the next day's newspaper. And this is just an extraordinary work of, of comic strip art and a work of art as far as I'm concerned. And I love it. And I loved him and I don't understand why his, he seemed to disappear from uh, cartoonist views. I mean, there's something about all of us, uh, well, certainly the contemporary generations, the last two or three, who are mostly aware of, uh, work going only two or three generations back. If it's before Harvey Kurtzman, no, nobody knows who, what was going on. And that's too bad, because some great things were going on. And there were others, like Chris Ware, who was, brought us back the work of Frank King and Gasoline Alley, uh, which is, was an extra, another extraordinary exercise in, in cinematic storytelling. Um, as we know, you know, a lot of us here are at least familiar with the outlines of Comics History. We know that um, you know, the, the comic strip uh, sort of begat the comic book, which was kind of a way of re-merchandising the comic strip and repackaging it before original content came into the picture. 
And your book, The Great Comic Book Heroes, was for I read this book when I was like ten years old. I can see that. And well, that's not my that's not my copy. That's not my copy. I found that picture online. But I mean, that book was that book really, um, you know, as they say, blew my mind at that age in a couple of different ways. That was certainly the first time that I was even exposed to you know decades at that time decades old versions of these characters who still existed in popular culture. Um, but it was also kind of a window to this other previous world of comic books of characters who didn't exist anymore and things like that. Because you, you write about, you know, Sheena and the Blue Beetle. You also, there's a lot of, like, salty language in that book. So for me, it's like... <laughs> for a kid, yes. Yeah, I didn't understand what you were talking about half the time. You know, like Wonder Woman with balls. Like, I, you know, I didn't, you know... Yeah, but uh, I didn't say fuck. Well, no, no. But <laughs> well, you did I don't, I don't know what you're complaining about. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm not complaining at all. It was just, uh, it was a lot to chew on. But um, one of the big things, one of the big things um, in that book as well, that was certainly the first time that I saw um, Eisner's spirit, which you've uh, already mentioned. Um, and this is the story that you chose for that book. Um, and this this was seemed like a very exotic um, story to me at that time. I mean, it had, you know, quote unquote, exotic subject matter. Um, but this was this this impressed me um, very deeply when I read it. Did was there was there a sense at the time that Eisner was a kind of unknown cartoonist or that the spirit was something that wasn't considered um, uh, a commonly known part of comics history? See, it seems to me uh, because I was so personally involved with Eisner and his spirit, I can more easily talk with certainty about Kniff, uh, who I didn't know at the time. We later became friends. But but um, but Will uh, and the spirit were um, a strong influence on me and on my thing. He was a Jewish boy from the Bronx during the depressing years, and I was a Jewish boy from the Bronx during, I mean, some eight years younger than he, or nine years younger than he, but still out of the same kind of depression and same uh, outlook on the, uh, the city, which he so brilliantly captured in his sketches of, of Central City, which uh, were, you know, clearly Manhattan. Um, but, um, Take a look, I mean, I described in Terry and the Pirates, that page. Uh, this is a very different kind of action page. But just take a look on this page, particularly in the, in, in the middle panel and, and the last three pictures, um, of the use of space, the, the use of empty space to convey movement, to convey action. And in, in panel four, you have this uh, long shot of two figures running out of a lit, lit door, you know, you know, why is that lit so brightly and against a blue background? And they're running, and you feel them running. And, uh, and you feel the distance they have to cover. And then suddenly they're in a fight with the spirit, and he's fighting them off and fighting them back, and he's filling the, that entire panel. His legs are spread eagle. There's no, not an inch left to, to draw anything against the purple background. Why purple? And suddenly there's a bright yellow background. Why yellow? And uh, but it, it, all of it seems right. All of it seems, and the action is uh, the tiny figure of the spirit in panel uh, 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 six, uh, crouching and throwing this guy over his head, who in, who in real life, if you compare the size of them, is three times the size of the spirit. I mean, it's all out of whack, but it's brilliant. And then they're falling, and you know, I mean, all of it is cinematic. And, and, and the, the two most cinematic cartoonists were Eisner and Kniff. And I never talked to Eisner, uh, I don't think. I don't remember talking to him about whether he was influenced by Kniff or not. But the two of them had an awful lot in common in terms of their influences, which were movies, I mean, movies of the time. Um, Kniff actually drew a character who was modeled after Clark Gable. Uh, Eisner would often write spirit stories that were uh, stolen from MGM movie plots, or you know, and, and I mean, it was clearly the, the uh, uh, or or, um, or noir movies, and uh, and there was this, there was just a go, go back one. I want to, 
This is called a splash page. And, um, and nobody did this before Eisner did. Nobody played with the title. Nobody thought of using the name of the character to create atmosphere, or to create a scene, or to, re to, to create a poster-like effect, a pop poster-like effect. And Eisner began doing this all the time, uh, using wild perspectives and shadows and shapes. And, um, and it was, you know, and, and so uh, this appeared in the Philadelphia Record, which was one of the papers that the Spirit, as a comic book supplement, it was a 16-page supplement which was then, because of paper shortages, reduced to eight pages. Uh, that the, and, and, and it ran with the Sunday, uh, uh, Sunday supplement of uh, color comic strips, which were just one, you know, one or two on a page. And this was a, a comic book, because the newspapers were eager to get younger readers and enticed to comics, because the, these daily strips and Sunday strips were for an older audience, as it turned out. They weren't for kids. And they wanted to draw in the kids, but the spirit was not an adult strip. It was, a, it was, I mean, a kid strip. It was very much for adults, and became more and more so. That's just the first spirit strip that shows how he began, and uh, and the drawing is much more primitive at that time. But Eisner got better faster. And um, you've alluded to the fact that you worked for Eisner. I think it's it's well known that you wrote uh, a lot of the. Uh, post-war spirit stories, including some of the ones that we remember the best, like this one, 10 minutes, uh, that I... Well, uh, this was the first one I did for him. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. Yes. And I used my neighborhood in the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, which is now Central City. And the conceit was, uh, while I love the spirit, I love the storytelling in the, in the spirit, I also loved some shows on radio, and the one I loved the most. And radio was a big deal. This is before television. Radio drama was a big deal, and the best of them, for my money, was a show called Suspense, uh, produced and directed by a man named William Spear, uh, which sounded like a, you, were watch, you were watching a movie on the radio. I mean, it, it, it felt so real. Uh, and, um, and as I listened to Suspense, I was in the story, and completely. And I wanted to do a spirit story that pulled the reader in the way suspense pulled me into the radio, but to pull them into the comic. And so I came up with the idea that this is happening in real time, that as you read, that it will take you about 10 minutes to read this story and 10 minutes for this character to go through to his adventure in which he will, have, he will die by the end of the story. Uh, and then I tell the story of this neighborhood near do well, this bum. Uh, and I started with a girl play, little girl playing a, a bouncy ball on the street, uh, as the kids in my neighborhood did, and lots of neighborhoods did in, in the 20s and 30s and 40s and even into the 50s, beginning with, a hey, my name is Alice, and my sister's name is Betty, and we see down country, and, and, you know, the, you know, and um, and so you know, the, the, the idea of creating something very normal and mundane into which sudden violence happens. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, a technique I learned from the suspense show based on the writings of writers for pulp magazines like uh, there was a man named Will, William Irish who wrote under the pseudonym also of Cornell Woolwich. And he had, as Hitchcock, often did, people doing very normal things into which suddenly they are thrown into a world of crime. You know, a man goes out to buy a newspaper and he never returns. Uh, things like that. You know, you're doing something very, very ordinary and it leads to something extraordinary. And that fascinated me. Because living in the Bronx, only ordinary things happen to me and I wanted adventure. I didn't want them personally, I wanted it on paper. The, you know, the, the only adventure I wanted all the drama I wanted, I was happy to have translated on paper. I was scared of my shadow, so I didn't want it in real life. And um, you, uh, you were given the opportunity to write and draw uh, what, what I'm aware of as your first broadly published work as a cartoonist, a one-page strip called Clifford that ran for a while in the spirit section. Um, this is so different from, visually, stylistically, this is so different from the work that most of us know from you, I'm kind of wondering, you know, when you had this opportunity to 
do a, a for, you know a, a published weekly page for the first time in your life why you chose this particular kind of character. I didn't choose particular... a damn thing. Oh, really? yeah. I, I was just, I didn't know what I was doing. And I was not equipped to know what I was doing. And I didn't have the skill to do what, what I didn't know I was doing. So, I mean, I knew how to write a cartoon, whether it was a spirit story or a humor strip. But my drawing, uh, I was used to doodling in a way and drawing characters in pencil on paper and did some very good ones. And in art school, I, you know, doing figure drawing. But when it, when it turned to translating this into finished art that would be reproduced, I froze and, um, uh, and found myself doing stuff that, that was imitating people I admired. So I was, you can't see it here, but I was trying to be Walt Kelly. Now, you, there's no trace of that at all, but that's what I had in mind. And, um, and also in terms of perspectives and layout, I, you know, I was influenced by the way Eisner laid out the spirit. I couldn't do it, I was doing a lousy job. This is a rotten piece of work. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it, it, it got better. Uh, and, you know, I mean, every week I did one, and each week I got better. So by the end, by 1950, I was a hell of a lot better than this. And I'm a little pissed off that you showed this. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, but um, the reason it appeared in the first place is I've been writing the spirit for over a year, and I was making something like $35 a week, and I asked Eisner to pay me 50 because I was writing the spirit. And he said, you're not worth it to me. I'll give you the back page. <laughs> so that was, so uh, his, his, uh, his reward to me was to give me more work and pay me, <laughs> and I'll pay me for that. But um, I seized on it because I loved the, and, and what I hoped to do in Clifford was to do the life of a, a real kid in the Bronx as I knew it to be, and not like the kids one saw in comics who were, pesky and bad boys and getting into trouble all the time and, and was part of gangs and none of which had anything to do with my life as a kid in the Bronx. So what I'd come up with with the idea and did it with mixed skill was a kind of pre-Peanuts Peanuts by the time Sparky Schultz came around with Peanuts, which was maybe six to nine months later. He had a much better grasp of what he was after than I did. But his drawing was lousy also. I mean, if you see the early Peanuts, it was, it was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. and well, he was also but, clearly uh, imitating what he thought was a kind of slick magazine cartoon style. It took a little while before it really looks like his work. It, well, he, he, but he, he also was clearly influenced by Roy Crane and Washtubs and Captain Easy. And, and within, I don't know, certainly a year, maybe a little longer, uh, he had established a style for himself that was enviable and, and, um, and had that lifeness of touch that one found in, in the work of Roy Crane. And, you know, in terms of movement, action, stylization, and, uh, and created with these little doodles characters who were very real people and recognizable. So, I mean, what he was doing, I mean, he may have started after I did doing this kind of work, but what he did was so far beyond what I was able to do uh, in Clifford, because between Charlie Brown and Lucy and Charlie Brown and Schroeder uh, and, and Charlie Brown and Linus, I mean, these, these were real characters with real inner lives. And, you know, I was not no shape to create anything like that. Mm -hmm. But you did, you did something at least as significant, if not more, just a few years later after um, your experiences in the army, you, you uh, re-entered the workforce and you started your comic strip 666 in 1956. And this, this is as revolutionary as any comic I can think of in history in the sense that, you know, you say, for example, that Eisner was writing for adults, but it's still, it's still a kind of cleaned up editor's version of, of a, a comic for adults. This, I think, is the very first modern comic strip that's literally intended strictly for an adult audience with no concession to uh, you know, editorial uh, censorship or uh, being on a reading level where a kid could approach it or anything like that. Well, if you looked at the single panel 
drawings or cartoons or I don't know what you'd call them of Stig in his books before he was doing them in a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. uh, go back to that one, please. Oh, sure. That, for, that, that early one. Uh, uh, he was the first, to my knowledge, to present the concept in cartoon form of anxiety. Can I actually have a Stig image, like the lonely ones? Yeah, kind yes. Of thing? Uh, and and uh, that's the cover of a book, but you can see that, you know, that uh, you can see these are people who are lost and depressed and, and puzzled and curious, all of all displaying um, attitudes not familiar to the comics reader uh, who had a history reading comics from the very beginning. You didn't find, you, you, you found comic befuddlement over a particular situation, but not befuddlement with life. Mm -hmm. And these characters clearly are lost. And they're lost one way or the other. And, and they could be depressed, but they're full of anxiety. They're full of reflective moods. They're moody. They're melancholy. They're all of those things, whatever you, uh, uh, euphemism you want to use. And when I saw those, I thought, oh, my God. That's, you know, he opened the door. I mean, there's several people opened the door for me. And so he gave me permission. Steig gave, taught me how to think in terms of anxiety. It's not as if he... I learned about the existence of anxiety. I didn't know it was a subject matter until Steig told me. Just as I didn't know that I could be dirty until I saw Lenny Bruce in the club. And that's, you know, without Lenny, I never would have written Cardinal Knowledge, because he gave me permission. He gave Philip Roth permission to write Portnoy. I don't think that would have been done without Lenny Bruce. Uh, certain people come along at a certain time and give you permission. And that's wonderful. You know, it frees you, it gives you license. So I was trying to incorporate into a cartoon form, and I didn't have a style for it then. Here I was trying to adapt what I thought of as the UPA style of cartooning at the time, because UPA was a, doing the most sophisticated adult form of animation at the time. So I was trying to get, you know, but I, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. But I did know what I was writing. And I was writing to convey, um, confessional dialogue, uh, self-involvement, uh, people who would, you know, would like the people on you in the village who could talk endlessly over a beer or a drink about themselves without, any, without caring who listened or who was conscious. And uh, I, mean, I re remember once talking, at, at, there was an, a photo editor for Mademoiselle magazine who was at a table, having a, a professional table talking about work. We were all, this, this was about me doing work for Mademoiselle. I was with a couple of editors. And he, st he, he had a glass of wine and started talking about his impotence. And I sat there listening and thinking, my God, 20 years ago, you, somebody would have put a gun to his head to keep this private, you know, and, and they wouldn't want anybody to know. Now it's part of our conversation. And did I tell you about my impotence? Let me tell you about my impotence. <laughs> I can't get it up. Did I tell you that? You know, and and uh, I, so all of this stuff I saw as material. All of this stuff I saw as a reflection of who and what we... When I came along and got fortunate because the Village Voice were the only people who would hire me, and they were then starting their second year, and they were being read, so I was... The, the luck and the grace of being in the right time at the right place not for the first time in my life. But, you know, th th these accidents, when they happen in your favor, uh, are extraordinary. Because if I had come along, I mean, I had been doing this stuff in one form or another for over three or four years now, since I got, a, since I, I got drafted in 51. And I couldn't sell anybody anything until I went to The Voice in 56. So it was five years, and I had these books of satire, Passionella, Boom, uh, something called the... Uh, uh, 666, which was which became out in Playboy as the oddball. Uh, all these stories I couldn't interest anybody in and until I went to The Voice. And uh, and if The Voice hadn't been there, I wouldn't be here today. You know, that, I, mean, I wouldn't have had this career. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's... Uh, uh, what I wanted to do is show the generation I was living in what it was like to be themselves, because they were unrepresented. 
that, that the humor one found in magazines, including the best of them, like the New Yorker, rep were represented a, a generation older and didn't talk about the things that the people I knew talked about. The people I knew who talked, this was post Joe McCarthy, but it was still Eisenhower's presidency. And as I've said many times, uh, the liberals I knew all around me didn't know they had First Amendment rights, that they had been so crushed by the politics of the time that was allegedly out to destroy communism, but actually was out to destroy and reverse the course of liberalism. That fight is still going on. Uh, th that was the beginning of the fight. You still see this very day where the attempt is to take, to destroy social security, to destroy health care. It's all, you know, it's, it's no different today. It, it's, these are the people, now they call the Tea Party, and they used to be the white power establishment. But um, these are the people who thought America was great in the 1920s before there was any social legislation at all. And then this goddamn depression has to go along with this misguided government butts his nose into the business and, and somehow gets us out of the depression. It needs a war to do it. But you see in front of you the attempt to destroy all of this. And, uh, and people were very nervous and, 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 and careful about what they had to say about all of this. And I found that the generation I came out of who were nervous about dealing with subjects that might get them into trouble grabbed the things I was doing because it was what they were thinking, but they didn't know what you can, that, that people were saying to me at the time, not to how brilliantly satiric or funny it was, but how'd you get that into print? How'd you get that into print meant that if I talk this way, I'd get killed or I could lose my job. Well, I didn't have a job to lose. I was a total failure. I mean, I, there, was, there was no way I could go down any more than I had. So uh, I had the freedom of failure to do whatever I goddamn pleased. And, um, and that was my, good, it was my good fortune to be a failure when I went to The Voice and just played from that time on with being a bad boy. Um, doing, doing what you uh, please, um, it was resulted in, in a number of remarkable things. You sort of alluded to this a minute ago that you had been trying to sell these longer stories like Passionella, Monroe, um, uh, well known uh, as as having been adapted into an animated cartoon, also. That's yeah. And uh, I just want to I just want to make a point that's really important to me because I I teach comics history classes, and one thing I always teach my students because sometimes I have students who actually do you know know something about comics, but you know there's always in any field a lot of received wisdom, you know, and. Um, not no slight um, to Will Eisner, but like a lot of people come in and say, "Oh, Will Eisner, he created the graphic novel, or he made the first graphic yeah. novel." And what I one of the things I always point out is there was this very remarkable coincidence in the year 1959 where you published this great book, Passionella and Other Stories. There's a reprint from Fantagraphics, but it's not the same book. It's other material with yeah. that title. This is four new stories that are thematically related, original in a book format. And weirdly, weirdly, that same year, someone who you mentioned before, Harvey Kurtzman, did almost the same thing. He also published his book, The Jungle Book, which is four original comic stories for an adult audience thematically related in a book format. And these are, in terms of, if you're talking about breakthroughs or you know for content or form or format these are in no way distinguishable from what Eisner did almost 20 years later with a contract with God I mean the content and the style is very different but if this is a breakthrough work I think these were breakthrough works almost 20 years before well you know I wasn't trying to do anything I mean um Harvey was, of course, a great innovator with Mad Magazine and just about everything he touched for a while mm -hmm. until he kind of self-destructed. But he was extraordinary talent uh, and, uh, and a lovely man. Uh, um, all I was trying to do was tell in, in, in um, succinctly as I knew how as fables, things that had to do with the times we lived in, uh, that without acknowledgement, the world of America was changing, the world all around us was changing. And yet what one saw in film and what one heard, heard on radio and, and, and the early television 
uh, with throwbacks to the values of World War II America and pre-World War II America. And that generally was the, uh, 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 the stuff of drama and the stuff of comedy, particularly comedy. And there were some exceptions, like there were the extraordinary series of Sunday night shows that Philco and, uh, I forget, you know, but plays, Al Long plays by Patty Chayefsky and Tad Moselle and Robert Allen Arthur, and uh, that dealt with adult stories and adult themes and, and, and with unknown actors like Eva Marie Saint and Paul Newman and Walter Matthau, I and mean, they all got their start on these hour long radio shows. They were, act you know, they were Broadway actors, I mean TV shows. They were Broadway actors who were in New York and beginning their careers. And, they, and, and Patty was doing his extraordinary new you know, work. And, I mean, everybody was exploding. And, um, and doing no stuff that had been unprecedented. And I was representing my generation and my time doing that work too, to showing the transition from, with, from those old values, which nobody in charge, Acknowledged, were outdated and were departed, and it was just catch-up time. You know that that what are considered breakthroughs is really catching up to something that was happening a long time ago, and you finally tell it to everybody. You, you, my job, as I've always seen it, is to decode what is in front of us, and that we really know what we aren't acknowledging. And I thought of myself as the official decoder, and you know, and that 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 I was I was I was there to be the decoder and the town crier. And, and to do it as entertainment, because if I wasn't funny, I'd be killed. So it's, it's, it, all of that was well thought out by me, and I knew the name of the game and how to do it, and I knew how to get away with it, you know, how to make a point without being polemical, or to show the anger I felt, because all of that was counterproductive. If you show rage, if you make political speeches in, in, in a cartoon, nobody wants to know, nobody listens. But if you make it funny, if you make it charming, if you make it entertaining, and you sneak in the punch in the last couple of panels, you got them, and they'll listen. They'll pay attention. You, you break through their defenses. And that's what, that's what I thought the name of the job was in the cartoons, and no different in the plays, and no different in the movies, and no different in anything I've ever done, that you bring them along, you bring, that, that the audience is you, that there is no distinction between you and who you're writing for. So when I, when I was writing plays, I always thought of the audience as being on, I wanted the audience on stage with the actors. I wanted the audience, I wanted to engage them in a way with, where the arguments that are going on on stage, they would be the, a third party to two people having a fight. And they'd be taking their own sides. And they'd be, I wanted to involve, I wanted this to be a live thing. In Kill My Mother, I wanted to do the art so that it looked like it was happening right now. Uh, so that the drawings would have the sense of immediacy to pull the reader in to, you know, even though the story took place in 1933 and 1943, it looked as if the, it, it's happening at the moment right in front of your eyes, hop, you know, uh, hopping right off the page, right off you so that you cannot resist it. That was the name of the game I was trying to pl play and, tr and trying to pull off. Um, there, uh, at least for me, to do the words and pictures, whether it's a comic strip to, or it's a play, because plays are words and pictures, and films are certainly words and pictures, to do, they're, they're, they all have different rules and you play by the rules of the different form, but they all are, uh, but in whatever form I work in, or picture books for kids, um, uh, you're still the same guy. I mean, it's, it's how I think, it's showing my values. Rupert can dance, which you see up here, it's me figuring out after all of these years, trying to figure it, trying to figure it out how to use my dancer characters in a kid's book because I was uh, I always wanted to somehow do it, and I thought finally, oh. ha, dancing cat, that's the way, um, <laughs> and um, and so I, I do this little girl who was a modern dancer doing these steps, and her cat who was interested, and then becomes, and, and then when she goes to sleep. He becomes a dancer, puts on her shoes, and uh, and dances. And I had a ball doing it. And, and uh, uh, but all of these works, all of these forms, which people think of as me working in different forms, are to me one. It's a different. There are different parts of me and different sides sides of me. But they're 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 all the same attitude, the same politics, the same. Uh, love of certain things, the love of gesture, love of action. 
the reason I ended up doing dance was because I got uh, I got too old to do people beating each other up, to, to do you know men in action, kicking the hell out of each other as in comic books or superheroes. Uh, I, I, that didn't, was no longer interesting. But I love movement. I love gesture. Uh, I loved, uh, so The Dancer came into being, and this is a very political strip about the 60s with The Dancer. I thought it was about Ferguson, sorry. What's that? <laughs> or it could be about Ferguson, you know. I'm sorry, I can't hear. Oh, it could be about Ferguson today, too. I mean, there's, there's okay. some of these things that come up in your strips that just seem cyclical also. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Ferguson and the racism, the, 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 uh, we don't have the poll tax anymore. What we have is uh, voter fraud, which is non-existent, which is the same thing as the poll tax. Uh, we, you know, the, the, uh, we don't have literacy tests anymore. We just have uh, uh, all sorts of tests that uh, blacks and other minorities are, supposed to, are designed to fail. But God knows this has nothing to do with racism or prejudice. Uh, uh, it's uh, one of the things on Thur Ferguson, I mean, CNN, I, I found this on, heard this on, Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC had this the other night. Uh, well, uh, the Times and, other, and CNN and other agencies are talking about the, the, the mixed testimony of witnesses in Ferguson who saw the action. Uh, all of the public testimony so far has not been mixed. They all, they all described the same thing. And uh, the problem was everybody described the same thing were black. And they were, there, there were people who didn't know. I mean, only one of them knew the victim. Uh, but they were all, they all were colored, and uh, and then it happened that two other witnesses showed up, and suddenly CNN says, "Well, this is the first real validation we see of what really happened, and now this cl seems clearly a homicide." And what was the difference? Lawrence O'Donnell asked. Well, it was clear there was a difference. The two new witnesses were white. Now, uh, I'm sure the people who make these judgments. Uh, and think this is new testimony is suddenly valid would deny vigorously that, that, that this is racist in any possible way. But how else do you explain this? And that, how many years since the Voting Rights Act, uh, Voting Rights Act how, how many years since Lyndon Johnson said we shall overcome? Uh, how, you know, how many changes do we go through before we realize that it, it, that we have to just do this fight all over again from scratch. That that whatever we've learned, and we've learned a lot, and whatever we've done, we've done a lot. But at bottom, there's the same old crap going on, just as there is uh, in regard to women in the women's movement. That some men are supposed to have learned so much. It's bullshit. Uh, that that so much of this is on the surface, and you give anything a chance to go back to where it started, and it'll be there in ten minutes. It, it's uh, th that's which, which is why it's a constant fight. Well, and we're, we're lucky to have your uh, example. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but please join me I in thanking- I didn't talk about my book. Please, uh, oh, sorry, we started- uh, What do you think I'm doing? Listen, I see people creeping in. Well, we talked about it a little bit, but- um, and, 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 <laughs> Sorry, but please, please join me in thanking Jules Pfeiffer for being here. I'm so sorry, we started late with the technical issue. I, I, and I, I screwed myself by talking too much about things I cared about. I'll never do it again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. You've been uh, terrific. And uh, do we have to empty the room now? Uh, yeah, we should. We should start. Uh, what, 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 what time is the next, next class? Well, we're running a few minutes late, so there are people are trying to come in right now. So we should probably. Fuck up. Does room. anybody want to ask a question? Oh yeah. Okay. One, yes. Two, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Or we had a humorous script to put all the gags in the carpet as one. Then in the early 50s, I guess you could say the overture to that was when Peanuts came in, because it was so small in size, you know, newspapers would put it at the very top where they had a little area to fill, which is a position where it remains in a lot of papers today. And uh, this in turn sort of led to the trend of the panels shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until they became the size of postage stamps, which drove a lot of cartoonists out of business. Yes, like Milton Knuth. Yeah. Now, at Du Bois, um, when you start working there, did they 
can get uh, assigned to you a specific. No, uh, they, 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 the voice, the, the voice, at, the voice was the voice. Any size you gave them, if I wanted a full page, they would have given me a full page. Uh, that's what the freedom the voice gave you was uh, counter to what newspapers. The voice was not a newspaper, and it was not a professional publication. The professionals were killing the form and had killed the form. Uh, and uh, I was anxious to re retain my amateur standing, as I am to this day. And um, because if you listen to the professionals, it's like listening to the experts on foreign policy. Look, look where we are now. And uh, the experts endlessly, the guys who know the business, endlessly get us into trouble and, and, and make the wrong judgments. So uh, I've been running counter to that my entire career, and I continue to. I, I think we'd better get out of here. All right. Anyhow, well, thank you. For the thank you again for all. For all